there, why don't you give us a bit of a a larger uh, bit of background on what you've been doing for the last uh, 20 uh, some odd years. Okay, Dennis. In, in 1965, uh, actually, uh, to live a, a fantasy of a life, because I had just gotten out of the military, graduated college, and in the military, uh, I had gotten into a fight over a $3 hat. A guy stuck a gun in my stomach, pulled the trigger, and it didn't fire. And later, when the military police grabbed it, it fired every time. As a 19-year-old, I came away from that uh, with an urgency to just live. I had uh, I had learned that any day is a good day to die, as the uh, old Arab refrain goes. And what better way to live an exciting, fantasy-filled life than to uh, become an undercover agent for the government, which is what I set out to be. And my first job was with... Uh, uh, the Internal Revenue Service's Intelligence Division, which had an organized crime division. And specifically what I did was ride around in a new car with a little hat on my head. Uh, I was one of the very few who uh, spoke Spanish, and uh, I looked very Hispanic, uh, aside, uh, even though I'm really a, a Polish Jew, first born in my family in this country. Uh, I guess I was a natural chameleon, uh, and uh, I, I learned the Spanish language very quickly as a, as a young man on the streets, and was able to bet with uh, uh, bolita people on the streets for the government, uh, was able to go undercover with Latin numbers takers, uh, as well as with uh, traditional organized crime. Around the same time, I, I learned that uh, my baby brother, David, who's four years younger than me, was a heroin addict. Uh, I, at that point in my life, had known a lot of heroin addicts. Some were my friends. And they had all either died or were well on, well on the way to an early death. And I believed everything that our government leaders told us, uh, that the way to avenge the youth of our country, to fight back, to defend our nation from, from what appeared to be a, an invasion. These are the words they use, an invasion of white powder by foreign, evil dark foreigners, was to go after the drug dealers. And I dedicated myself from that point on to doing that. I, uh, uh, and it was an easy thing to see as we, as history moved onward into the Vietnam War era, while 50,000 soldiers died in Vietnam on the streets of the United States during those same years. There were 80,000 homicides, and many of them were drug-related. So it, it was very easy for me to fall under the influence of uh, the verbiage of war. And I was very good at undercover. And as a matter of fact, I, I kind of turned myself into a, a human kamikaze, for lack of another expression. I mean... I couldn't lock up drug dealers fast enough. In those years also, the only two federal agencies fighting drugs, as it were, were the Federal Bureau of Narcotics with 250 agents in the world and uh, the Bureau of Customs, uh, who uh, uh, were, were fighting drug smuggling. And, of course, it was difficult to get into them, so the first job I took was with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which enforced the gun laws, and they enforced a law uh, that had to do with committing federal crimes while carrying a firearm, any federal crime. And I used that as a license to go after drug dealers. Instead of just going out on the street and, and ordering dope, I'd go out on the street and order dope and guns. And uh, I think in the first year uh, with ATF, uh, man, I, I mean, I just lived on the street. I would make four, five, and six buys a day, 90% uh, of the time not even covered by backup. And I was dragging in bodies. I was literally filling cages as fast as they could open them. Uh, I, by 1968 uh, or 1969, right after the Gun Control Act of 1968 took effect, at one point, I lived with motorcycle gang in Buffalo, and uh, I seized a couple of tons of dynamite and LSD, and uh, I just couldn't do it fast enough. I, I, I was indeed a human kamikaze, and all the time, what most people around me, I think, didn't understand, didn't get about me was that the only reason I was doing it was because 
I thought it was for real. Uh, we have to come cut back to uh, uh, my motivation. You know, I was a, I was a man who, at 19, with that gun stuck in my stomach, uh, the trigger pulled, and just by a miracle, a mechanical miracle, I was still alive. Uh, it, as the years transpired, I, I, I needed a mission. It had to be more. There had to be more to life to me than, than just living out fantasies in a rush to live. Uh, I needed the mission, and my brother's drug addiction and our leader's words were enough for me. Uh, I, I indeed had that mission. So then you went well, over to the DEA. Well, then I went to the Bureau of Customs Hard Narcotic Smuggling Unit, and my first collision with reality happened in 1971. Uh, I was I arrested a a drug smuggler at the uh, JFK, July 4th, 1971, as a matter of fact, and he I convinced him to work for me. It's a it's a long, uh, strange story, but this this young man whose name was uh, uh, John Davidson had been a Vietnam veteran, had made his drug connections in Thailand while he was on R&R, and when I arrested him at JFK, he had made his seventh trip into the U.S., three kilos of heroin each trip. And mind you, this was at a time when I think the biggest drug seizure on record was 65 kilos of heroin in the French Connection. Now, I was looking at one man who had just brought in 21 kilos in one year by himself. And... He con he consented to work with me and uh, in and in this dreamlike life that I was living, uh, he, uh, two snaps of the finger and there I was undercover in Bangkok, Thailand, living with John Davidson's connections, a fellow by the name of Liang Se Tu, and uh, his partners, and they were introducing me around the drug world of of the Far East. Uh, it was a fantasy, and I'm pretty much of a uh, a good con man. I mean, that's let's face it, that's what an undercover agent does. I was a, a good con man. I knew how to convince people of any race, any religion, that I was a bad guy. And uh, as a matter of fact, I now that I'm retired, I have a hard time convincing people who look at my face that I'm a good guy. Uh, but these, uh, these Chinese quickly fell, uh, and uh, they, they liked my act so much that they invited me to a place called Chiang Mai, to the, to the factory where they were producing heroin. Now, this was 1971, and they were talking about hundreds of kilos of heroin. Hundreds of kilos, to me, was an outlandish figure. How, who, who could believe that anyone was producing hundreds of kilos? Well, suddenly the case starts to go awry. Uh, from the moment I received an invitation to go to Chiang Mai and see the drug fa the heroin factory, uh, I was getting no cooperation from my own government. Uh, administrative uh, red tape was stopping me from getting sums of money as little as $2,000 to buy a kilo of heroin to show them that I was for real. I had to issue uh, excuse after excuse to, to these drug dealers why I couldn't come up with enough money to pay my hotel bill, and I was talking about buying hundreds of pounds of heroin. And uh, who was at fault behind this whole screw-up was some mysterious force in my government uh, that manifested itself as administrative screw-ups. Well, we cut to one late night. I'm called in to the embassy by uh, the customs attaché, uh, a fellow by the name of Joe Jenkins, and there, there was the Bureau of Narcotics, a BNDD agent at the time, and other people who, whose identity I didn't know. And I was told very simply that uh, you're not going to Chiang Mai. And I, of course, was, uh, you know, a good soldier. I mean, I have to tell you that later we learned that the source of heroin in Chiang Mai was the same source of a fellow by the name of Herman Jackson who was putting heroin in the, in the uh, dead bodies of uh, Vietnam, those killed in Vietnam, and smuggling smuggling them into the U.S. in coffins of no, in the bodies themselves, in the in rubber, the bodies themselves, yeah, in the body cavities, um, in the body bags. So, you know, the thought that anyone in my government would, in any way whatsoever, protect those sources of heroin was the most outlandish thing in the world. Uh, I think it was a, a year or two before uh, Al McCoy wrote his book. Uh, the politics of heroin, and had, uh, well, at that stage in my life, I wouldn't have read the book because, uh, you know, it would have been uh, called Pink Okami, you know. 
And uh, I was pro-America, right or wrong. I could not believe anyone in my country would do anything. So sum uh, up the situation again. This man, who, who is this man, Mr. Jackson, and he's... Herman how- Jackson case was a separate case uh, that I, I had worked on peripherally. And Herman Jackson was uh, a, a Vietnam uh, veteran who was in graves registration, and he went to... Uh, Thailand, where he, where he, when he left the military, he opened bars and things in Thailand. He maintained his connections with the uh, the uh, graves registration units in the military. Plus, he had the connections for heroin up in Chiang Mai. Again, as I said, the same source that I was working on, and uh, the the root of many of the bodies uh, back to the states, back to the U.S., was from Vietnam to uh, uh, back to Thailand where the graves registration people involved with Jackson would put heroin in the bodies or in the body bags. They would be shipped up to the U.S. for burial, and another member of the ring would remove the heroin from the bodies and body bags once they uh, once they arrived in the U.S. Now, that's really all I knew about that investigation. Uh, I had caught part of it uh, as a young uh, special agent with customs, in the port of New York, and but then got caught up in this case. So well, there you yeah. were. Here you are, somebody who was motivated into fighting drugs by virtue of the fact that uh, your younger brother was uh, ended up with a heroin addiction. Yeah. And now you find yourself uh, in Southeast Asia in a situation where your government appears to be involved in importing heroin. Well, well then it's a, it, I wound up in a situation where. It was almost uh, a godsend, as though destiny had sent me to the major source that anybody had heard of at that particular point. And uh, here I am with a chance to really get to the source, exactly what my leaders said. Uh, and uh, I, was, I felt privileged. I felt, my God, uh, you know, if I can get this source, even if I die doing it, this is the way it's supposed to be. I mean, we're all going to die. It's... Uh, it's uh, uh, I, I don't want to be I don't want to be accused of being uh, as fanatical as I probably was at that age, but I was you know, the typical uh, Vietnam soldier. Only I was a soldier in the drug war. I'm ready to die, and suddenly my government steps in and tells me you're not going to Chiang Mai. Did you I, say, "Hey, what's going on here?" Yes, and, and this was the first time in my uh, career I was told, "Look, there are there are other interests." that are more important. You don't know the big picture. And I accepted that. Well, who wouldn't? Uh, there I was. This was the first time uh, I, I had been uh, that far out of my country in my life. Uh, I was. I felt totally alone and isolated. Don't, I don't forget, at that point, I had been hanging out with two drug dealers in Bangkok, Thailand. The police themselves, <coughs> pardon me, didn't know that I was there because... Uh, they were involved, uh, you know, telling if, if the police had found out that I was an undercover agent, uh, at best I would have been arrested by the Thai police. At worst, well, you use your own imagination. So I felt totally alone and unprotected, and here I am, my government is telling me, uh, you, you know, we, there are other interests, you don't know the big picture, and I accepted that. Again, who wouldn't? I mean, could could you imagine your government... Well, for me, uh, ad- admitting to myself that my government was protecting uh, people who were using the, the dead bodies of RGIs, who had given their lives for their country to smuggle heroin, was to negate everything I lived for at that point. Just too much. You don't. You just can't accept that. And uh, again, as I said, my friend Al McCoy's book hadn't been published yet, and I probably wouldn't have read it then anyway. So. Uh, suddenly I'm given the money to buy one kilo of heroin. Uh, the two Chinese drug dealers deliver it to me. They're arrested. I had even met the, the uh, man who was making false bottom suitcases, and uh, he was arrested. Um, as a result of the case, they even had to arrest uh, one of the majors in the Thai police who was involved with them, and the case ended. And... <coughs> Around uh, the United States, the you know the case got a big media play, as they still do. You know, drugs on the table. Uh, it was the first time in, in our history that an undercover, one undercover agent, had gotten the smuggler 
in New York, the financier of the operation in Florida, and then the source, including the false bottom suitcase manufacturer in one undercover operation. So it got quite a bit of play. As a matter of fact, the case itself was written uh, up in a book by uh, Donald Goddard called Undercover. I think it's a, a Dell paperback. And uh, it, the America uh, never knew the truth. Well, I really didn't, at that point, know what the truth was. So we move on to, uh, I go back to the streets, and in 1973, the Drug Enforcement Administration is formed to end, uh, uh, I mean, uh, a bloody war between uh, DEA, between the Bureau of Narcotics and the Bureau of Customs, a turf war over who who is in charge of uh, the war on drugs and budget, and uh, a war, by the way, that has now spread to something like 53 federal agencies getting a piece of this war on on drugs budget, uh, including the military. But at that point, uh, President Nixon created the Drug Enforcement Administration to end that war. So 73, I hit. I was assigned to a street group and began, uh, again, breaking all records, uh, locking up drug dealers. I worked with a fellow named uh, Skippy Garcia, Emilio Garcia, a cute young Cuban agent, and uh, I think he and I together in one year had something like 300 arrests. Uh, it just, we never went home. And, and you were and, recognized for this work. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was recognized. I received award after award. They, they then made me... Uh, in acting in charge of an international group, and uh, I began working international cases. And at that time in my career, I began teaching the techniques of undercover work, uh, informant handling. And I began lecturing for the Drug Enforcement Administration on those subjects. In 1977, I was teaching uh, narcotic undercover to the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office investigators, it was February, and uh, I got a phone call right then that my brother, after 19 years of heroin addiction, had committed suicide. And if I needed further inspiration, uh, I just can't imagine what that would be. I hit the streets again with a vengeance. In 1978, uh, I was transferred to Buenos Aires, Argentina, as the country attaché. Uh, I was a diplomatic status. I was in charge of uh, uh, Argentina and Uruguay, all drug enforcement activities. For a period of time, uh, the FBI closed its office in the Southern Cone, and I absorbed all their work. Uh, I, in essence, for, for uh, several years, was the senior U.S. law enforcement officer in the, in the whole Southern Cone. It was in, during my uh, time in Argentina that I went undercover, and penetrated the Roberto Suarez organization. And now this is going to be covered in great detail in The Big White Lie. And, and that's going to be uh, your next book that uh, hopefully will be published uh, in right. fall or thereafter by Thundermouth Press. Let me just say that we're speaking with Michael Levine. Michael Levine is also the author of Deep Cover and Fight Back. Uh, he has been an um, undercover agent for 25 years with the DEA, with the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Bureau, and with the IRS. And we are talking about... Uh, some of the experiences that you, uh, Michael Levine, had during those years. This um, encounter with Suarez uh, would be, uh, as you said, it forms the backdrop for this book that's coming out, um, The Big White Lie. But uh, give us some of the background. What was going on there? What happened in when a, you began to get into that? In essence, I, I uh, penetrated the Roberto Suarez organization at a time when... Uh, Explain what that organization was. Well, that organization... Uh, was the first drug, in the words of the State Department, the first drug cartel to take over a whole government. Uh, in essence, the Roberto Suarez organization created uh, the general motors of cocaine. Uh, that still functions. You know, people look at Colombia as the source of cocaine when, in fact, it's not. Uh, Colombia does not grow cocaine. Uh, they get all, virtually 80% of their raw material back during this period of time, 90 to 95% of their raw material came from Bolivia. Uh, in fact, 90% uh, of the, the world's, according to the DEA right after the Suarez case, 90% uh, of the world's cocaine came from Bolivia. You, at that point in our history, you put Bolivia out of business, you end cocaine. And now here I was... 
uh, threatening the people who were, and this is the Roberto Suarez organization, uh, they were putting under one umbrella organization every coca grower in Bolivia. So what happens, uh, let, me, let me give you the, uh, the soundbite version of it. Uh, we could have destroyed them. Uh, I penetrated them. I made the, the then biggest drug deal in our history, $9 million for about 1,000 pounds of uh, raw coca base. And uh, I, I would have been accepted into this whole organization had we just bought the drugs, which we didn't, we, uh, uh, because of uh, power, the powers that be, or I should say the powers behind the scene, they only, the only thing they would agree to after trying to destroy the case for three months uh, was a buy-bust operation that would end uh, in a bank vault in Kendall, Florida. Uh, and with undercover agents flying down to Bolivia and picking up the then biggest load of cocaine in history. Well, that, that uh, case was written up as the great cocaine sting by Penthouse magazine. Uh, it was, got world press. Uh, uh, part of it was used uh, to, uh, for, to make the movie Scarface, was inspired by this case. Uh, I'd say 60 to 70 percent of the movie Scarface, with uh, Al Pacino doing a bad Spanish accent, it was the facts that came from this case. The only thing that was left out was that the United States attorney released the biggest drug dealers in the world. Uh, Pat Sullivan, the man who ironically uh, prosecuted Manuel Noriega, released the man that was paid $9 million for the drugs, Jose Roberto Gassa, without even putting the case before a grand jury. Now, that never made the press. Uh, Jose Roberto Gassa went back to Argentina, to uh, Bolivia, before I could get back there, and I was the undercover agent. And he and his father... Erwin Gasser, again, the details will be uh, put down meticulously in the big white lie because they're astounding. And every American who is at all interested in the reality of what started their drug war should read this. Uh, it is the true history. The true history being that Erwin Gasser, Jose Roberto Gasser, the people we arrested, uh, again, parenthetically, we had to get um, help from the then Bolivian government, Lydia Gala's government, which was probably the last South American government that was truly anti-drug. In payment for them helping us to make, to successfully make this cocaine sting, this huge sting, what they got was a CIA-led revolution, the now famous July 17th coca coup, wherein the very people we arrested and indicted were put in charge of Bolivia and the people who were truly anti-drug were paid for their anti-drug stance at great risk with murder, torture at the hands of CIA asset Klaus Barbie and his paramilitary organization, exiled from their country. Uh, you have to say a little bit more about how that worked. Well, how that worked was uh, I immediately went back to Argentina and... Uh, I uh, was astounded to find that uh, the people we had arrested were already released from jail and nobody had done a thing in the U.S. to try and stop them. Astounded to find that I was sitting on top of a revolution in South America and that the very same people whom I had arrested and indicted were now running that revolution. Uh, astounded to find that at that point uh, in my life, uh, I was uh, uh, more threatened than any of the drug dealers because they had placed uh, a $250,000 price on my head. The very people who had been arrested by my government and released by my government now go back to South America and offer a quarter of a million dollars for the death of El Judio Trigueño de Argentina. That was me, the dark Jew from Argentina. And uh, the, the money was offered to hit men throughout South America, some of whom happened to be DEA informants. Now, in Instead of our government hunting drug dealers, the drug dealers are hunting me. And, and, <laughs> and, the, and the government that was subverted, the government that you were working with, the anti-drug government ended were, up in torture chambers? They were, ended up in torture chambers, murdered, exiled from their country. And that was the last truly anti-drug government in the history of Bolivia, as far as I'm concerned. And it was and, also the birth of the Medellin cartel. Uh, well, that followed. Uh, uh, what, uh, what happened uh, almost... 
Well, this, this was just coincidental, I think. The Medellin cartel uh, was birthed shortly thereafter, but what was uh, uh, very convenient for the Medellin cartel was you already had the general motors of coca production set up in Bolivia. Now, how did I find out about this? The, very Argent, the Argentine secret police with whom I had to work and, and depended on were also working for the CIA. And it was uh, the specifics of it are going to be in the book, exactly how I found out about it, exactly who told me. Uh, they uh, admitted to me when I wound up involved in a subsequent case that if what happened during the Suarez case and during this subsequent case called the uh, Hugo Otalo Candia case were made public, uh, in the words of one of the Argentine secret police, both your government and mine will be very embarrassed. And what we were learning in that subsequent investigation was everything I'm telling you, that the U.S. And, Ar and its Argentine war dogs were training the Bolivians for torture. Uh, they, were, they were behind Klaus Barbie's paramilitary organization, working with them. And how did I learn that? I learned that from the Argentine secret police, with whom I had to work very closely with in Argentina in making drug cases, whom were working at the same time for the CIA, in training uh, the paramilitaries under the control of Klaus Barbie, uh, in training Bolivians to torture, and were, were uh, in essence, the war dogs of the CIA in setting up and executing this revolution, which now became famous as the Coca Coup, July 17th, 1980, which ended up putting the very people we indicted and arrested in power. They were now running the country. Uh, our drug war became the laughing stock of all South America, where it counted. What or every government in South America learned from that event was that you can't trust America, the American drug war. So at the one point where we could have really shut down drugs, instead what we did is we, the CIA, created the general motors of cocaine. Now, if you look at any graph of our drug problem, our cocaine problem, our crack problem, it began with that July 17th coup. It began right there. Our country did it. Our country, our covert agencies. Now, in the words of uh, Senator Kerry, the American people had been de betrayed, only he didn't know a tenth of it. He was only talking about Iran-Contra. Senator Kerry said that the, our covert agencies had converted themselves into channels for drugs. Well, they had done a lot more than that. Our covert agencies had betrayed the American people by setting up the general motives of cocaine. Now, this is the, probably the first time you're hearing it. It's going to be very, very closely, minusculely detailed in the book, The White So Life. what you're saying, though, just to sum up, what you're saying, Michael Levine, is that if it were not for the CIA, who had, uh, and I want to ask you in a minute what how they justified their motives, but if it wasn't for the CIA operation that subverted your undercover um, uh, operation, it appears that we wouldn't, we may not have even had the Medellin cartel. That this wouldn't have occurred, or at least in the, with the great uh, power and the great access to this country, wouldn't have uh, taken place. Well, who, who's to say? I, I mean, what I what I will. What I will clearly say from the, I, I have a lot of knowledge from firsthand experience of how the drug business works. What, at, at worst, we would have wound up with a, a many, many year delay in the start of our cocaine problem. It would have, it would have taken uh, the drug dealers, uh, the drug producers, uh, a Herculean effort to get around uh, the obstacle we should have set up. Uh, which which should have paid us off in cooperation from all the governments in South America. Instead, uh, w what resulted was a gigantic boost. You know what JATO is, Genesis takeoff that they used to use for uh, giant bombers during the, in the 50s to get them off the ground? Well, the whole drug economy was, was jet-assisted uh, with that one act by the CIA. I, I mean, this was the beginning of the general motors of cocaine that still exists. Now, and Michael Levine, let me ask you, you must have been, I guess to put it mildly, furious. Uh, here you are, essentially risking your life to do what you thought was a patriotic act, motivated by um, your brother's problems with heroin. And uh, your whole operation is subverted. Did you attempt to confront 
some of the agents, some of the people who were involved in this uh, policy, and what did they say? Oh, I, conf- I try to confront everyone. I started to uh, complain loudly. In fact, in my country report, uh, uh, which are uh, classified as secret, uh, I, I said that the U.S. has to make a choice between communism and drugs. Uh, that was my ni- the December 1980 country report. Um, uh, I was outraged. Yeah. And then Newsweek magazine had an article uh, written by Larry Roeder and Stephen Strasser that sort of hinted at CIA involvement in drugs. And that was enough to really turn me loose. I mean, I sat down and did probably the worst thing I could have done uh, as far as risking my life. Uh, and that was I wrote a letter <clears throat> on U.S. Embassy stationery, Argentina, to Larry Roeder and Stephen Strasser. And I uh, sent it return receipt requested. And in the letter, I told them, if you want a real story, why don't you check on why R- Jose Roberto Gasso was released by Sullivan, the U.S. attorney, why Alfredo Cotucci Gutierrez was, was uh, released by Judge Alcee Hastings, why he dropped the bail uh, on uh, uh, this other biggest drug dealer in our century, and why no one in our government did anything to stop them from leaving the country, and so on. And I never got an answer from they them. They didn't pick up the lead? Newsweek didn't pick up that lead? The only thing I knew was that it was delivered because someone from Newsweek signed the return receipt requested, which I have. Uh, mysteriously, again, uh, there's so many. Uh, you know, I can, I can go on at, uh, ad nauseum uh, about the events that were happening to me. But, uh, again, the, short, the, the shorthand version of what happened next is I was put under an intensive investigation by internal affairs of the Drug Enforcement Administration, Mysteri- never confronted with my accuser, other than uh, to be told that the informant whom I had used uh, to do the Roberto Suarez case originally had accused me of uh, black marketing and uh, taking her informant money. Well, they quickly found out that that was not true, but their investigation spread into every corner of my life. Uh, They wrote me up for things like uh, uh, playing my radio too loud in the American Embassy, rock music, and uh, disturbing other elements for not knowing where the CIA office was. There was no stone left unturned in trying to hurt my career uh, and jail me. Uh, I mean, I was falsely accused of black marketing. I was falsely accused of stealing money. I was falsely accused of... uh, uh, rigging my vouchers. They put you in jail for this? Uh, sure. It's per- it was perjury. It's uh, grand larceny. I was given my my constitutional rights every time I was interrogated. Uh, every single voucher I had ever written for the government was pulled and closely investigated. Uh, my phone calls were all examined. I know, my, I know that my phone was tapped. Uh, my uh, house in Argentina was broken into. And, and ransacked, and uh, an attempt was made on my life. Um, I was forced transferred from Argentina to DEA headquarters in Washington, where I was placed under investigation, and at the same time asked to work undercover in their most sensitive operation, an operation called Operation Hun, wherein I, I was put undercover with a, a woman who used to sell cocaine for the Bolivian government, only she happened to be also a CIA asset, and who was targeted? The very people who our government had let go in the first place, Uh, the the Bolivian cocaine cartel. This was Operation Hun. Now, during the many months I worked undercover, living in a luxury house with this woman, I was still under intensive investigation by my own government. Now, here you had, on one hand, uh, my own government accusing me of everything from black marketing to playing my radio too loud. And on the other hand, they're putting me undercover in their most sensitive investigation. Which was the investigation that was undermined initially. Uh, Exactly. So here you were back at start, back go. Back to to the get-go. And I was literally being torn apart. Why were they uh, doing this to you? Why why did they have this Well, they... I think what they wanted to do, I believe now, in retrospect, they just wanted to keep me under control. And that was no better way than, than doing that. Uh, they have a habit of taking uh, some of their, the, the, uh, the high-level bureaucrats, are very smart. What they do is they take the critics of a lot of their programs and they put them in charge of the operation. Uh, in my case, what did they do? I'm criticizing that all these people were let go. Well, they, they make me the key undercover against these people. Go get them. 
and at the same time keep me under control by an intensive investigation. Well, this went on for many, many months, and while we were undercover living in this house, uh, this woman and I, incredible things happened. I mean, if you wrote it up for a movie, no one would believe it. Uh, in comes killers from, uh, from Colombia. They were our house guests. Uh, one of the, our house guests was called uh, the number one of the extraditables. And it turns out that she was just a, a customer of my informant. Um, again, our government, on camera, we had people admitting to homicides. Uh, some people were talking about selling drugs to uh, uh, having their best customers were judges and U.S. attorneys. They were mysteriously let go and never arrested. Uh, some some violators were let go. Some were arrested. There was a pick and choose. You know, depending on what power you had as an individual, what political power you had, you were arrested or not arrested. Now that was all documented under Operation Hun. Now this again is all going to be part of the big white lie. The specific the specifics of it. Uh, in the middle of this, my daughter uh, becomes a cocaine addict, and. I am, uh, at that point, I didn't know what war to fight first. My daughter, my, my ex-wife and I were separated. I was actually living in Washington. Uh, I was undercover in Operation Hunt in Arizona. Uh, and at the same time, I was also assigned to Vice President Bush's task force in South Florida. So I was, I was shuttling, literally, literally shutting between my undercover assignment, uh, my assignment in Vice President Bush's task force, from where they were sending me out on other undercover assignments, and Washington, and in the midst of this, my daughter has a drug problem. I'm still fighting what's going on. I'm still, uh, I, I turned to everybody from B'nai B'rith to uh, uh, anyone who would listen to me to try and get some support. I had no money. Uh, I, I spoke to attorneys who all wanted a classical buck before they'd even sit down with me. Uh, the media had already, as far as I was concerned, betrayed me. What do you do, really? What does it, and the American people wonder why no one comes forward. I was a classic example. Right about at this point, uh, I have to tell you a quick anecdote, uh, Santi Barrio story. Santi Barrio was a DEA agent, a uh, very highly motivated guy who uh, was sent to Mexico, the hotbed of all of this hypocrisy. And after, two years after being stationed in Mexico, was arrested smuggling heroin. In jail, Santi Barrio uh, took a bite of a peanut butter sandwich, fell down into convulsions. His wife was told while he was in a coma, his wife was told that there's strychnine in his blood. And uh, a month later, he dies, and the autopsy report says that he died of asphyxiation on a peanut butter sandwich. Well, of course, within DEA, uh, many, many agents believe that either DEA or the CIA killed Santi Barrio. That, that, for me, was, again, a hard concept to swallow. I couldn't believe that my government would kill one of its own agents. Why Who the heck would believe did? that? Why would they think that? That he knew too much. He just knew too much. The, 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 uh, uh, the story that went with it was that Santi knew too much about CIA operations involving drug smuggling and uh, all the dirty dealing that goes in the world that I lived in for 25 years. And I get a phone call now. I'm sitting and I have a, an application for a hardship transfer in. Uh, to get back to New York and fight my daughter's daughter. yeah, to deal with my daughter. I'm under investigation, and I get a call from a man who is now a high-level man in DEA, and he says the following. He says, Mike, I like you, but remember a peanut butter sandwich. And I say, you have got to be kidding. I mean, I can't. He says, no, I'm not kidding. And that was enough for me. Uh, I stopped fighting. I was also told a bureaucracy, Mike, has a very short memory. And you just keep your mouth shut and they'll forget and you'll be, your career will be back on track, everything will be fine. Well, now this peanut butter, this was a threat. You took this as a threat that well, the I same didn't. thing would happen to you as happened to this other agent. Yeah, but I took it from this particular person. Uh, I believe he genuinely liked me. I didn't believe he was threatening me. But he wanted to alert you. That's but he something. wanted to alert me. Uh, you know, I don't know whether he had heard something. I don't know uh, uh, what exactly was going on. But I, I admit it. I was scared to death. 
they, they scared me into silence, complete silence. And uh, suddenly the, uh, my investigation ends, this two-and-a-half-year investigation, and the only thing they could charge me with was failure to keep proper records uh, on my vouchers, which is kind of like uh, charging uh, uh, a soldier in Vietnam with failure to keep proper accounting records for his income tax return. Uh, and the other thing that uh, it was very interesting about this particular charge, that there was no violation. I mean, there was nothing in the book that said failure to keep records, but I was warned to just accept that. Michael Levine, there you were, scared to death, finally silenced, I, trying to deal with the situation around your daughter yeah. having a, a heroin or a cocaine product. So uh, I, I, I made it very clear that I was no longer a threat. Uh, I wasn't going to fight. I was just going to accept anything they did to me, which I did. And I was given the hardship transfer to New York and went back to work uh, undercover in New York City. I was a group supervisor. I was a task force supervisor. I was, uh, you know, back in the drug war and at the same time fighting my daughter's drug battle constantly. Uh, thank God uh, I, uh, I practiced what I now preach about drug problems, and we won my daughter's drug war. Um, had the following not occurred, I probably would have gone into history silently, unknown, uh, which is really what I wanted. I could never have imagined myself writing the books uh, that I'm writing and saying the things I'm now saying. It was as far, uh, believe me when I tell you, I started out in this business politically uh, to the right of Attila the Hun. Uh, I mean, way to the right of what Attila the Hun. What does that Hun. mean? Well, I, I, it was my country, right or wrong. I didn't question anything they said. I followed orders. Yeah, th what, what you see before you is their creation. Uh, they did two things to me. They made me one of the best they've ever had at undercover and at documenting criminal cases and criminal conduct. And then they acted as criminally as you could in front of me. And that's what you now see. Uh, you know, the, I'm the end product of their doing. Now, had I not had, uh, in uh, September 87, I get a call to go undercover again in Operation Trifecta. And had Operation Trifecta not happened, where we penetrated the top of the drug world in three countries in probably what should have been the most far-reaching undercover case in, in history, and it was destroyed in all three countries, well, that set me off. That pushed me over the line. Uh, at that point, I, I said to myself, you know, I wasn't saved from... Uh, that bullet when I was 19 years old to, uh, to keep my mouth shut. And I wrote Deep Cover uh, and now Fight Back. Uh, now uh, uh, the big white lie is coming out to set history straight, to tell America what victims they have been and what a deadly, long-running lie they have paid for. Okay, now let's pick up on some of that work that uh, came after. Uh, you're finally being fed up and leaving your uh, work with the DEA and with the government. And you've, as you said, you've published uh, Deep Cover, which was sort of a general analysis about how the CIA and the DEA continually undermine through, uh, through both uh, uh, I, stupidity. I, I got to differ with you. If you read Clo Deep Cover, first of all, it wasn't general. It was from the eyes of the undercover agent who lived it. It was very specific. It showed everything that happened, uh, including when uh, Edwin Meese blew the cover of undercover agents uh, who, uh, w who would have exposed high-level Mexican corruption in the drug world. Uh, Edwin Meese himself telephoned the Attorney General of Mexico to warn him about us while we were working undercover with a member of the Attorney General's office. Uh, you know, buying drug protection from the Mexican military. Uh, there was nothing general about it. It was very, very specific. Uh, you know, we, we pointed out that even the, the head of DEA in Mexico refused to cooperate with the investigation. Uh, when we tried to find out information from the very people who were selling us Mexican military protection and the U.S. ambassador in Mexico claimed that these people had no connection or with the government, we ourselves later found out that the head of DEA in Mexico, Ed Heath, had met and had dinner with one of the people who we had just bought six months before his arrest. Oh, come on. You're and telling me that the Attorney General of the United States called and undermined an operation in which you're working with his assistant? Absolutely. I mean, is that anything general about that, Dennis? I mean, this is not a general critique. I mean, this is... What I'm telling you is we were screwed. 
uh, by our own government. It, the, our government went out of its way to kill this case in every way you could imagine. Uh, here in Panama, I think I Why described, would, you know, my wife General and, uh, Mises was very conservative. Why would he want to undermine the drug war? Well, in the words of uh, the ex-commissioner of customs, Von Raab, when he angrily resigned his post, he said the U.S. is more interested in trade, trade relations, in oil deals, in covert operations, and in making the world safe for tea parties than really winning a drug war. Uh, what he was referring to was specifically Mexico and uh, also Attorney General. By the way, that's a, that's a criminal act. That was a criminal act. He should be indicted for that. Instead, uh, we're... we're uh, He's at the Heritage Foundation. Yeah, <laughs> you know, my God, it's it's just astounding. I mean, you have uh, now, I'm happy to say, a DEA agent, uh, Salario Castillo, uh, came out and told of going to uh, Ambassador Corps in Salvador and telling him that what was going on at El Pongo and telling him that the Contras were, were, were sending drugs to the U.S. with U.S. protection. And according to Castillo... He was told, well, that's a White House operation. Stay out of it. Well, you know, when you add to that, you hear uh, uh, again uh, John Kerry, U.S. Senate, telling how we've been betrayed. Uh, you hear Jack Blum, the man who was, uh, who's now a friend of mine, yeah, who, uh, who uh, was the chief counsel, resigning and saying uh, that he's sick to death of the truths he cannot tell. And the bottom line of all this is we've been betrayed, and yet not one. U.S. official is indicted for drug running. Well, they've made a wild man out of me. I'm going to keep. Uh, I'm going to keep plugging away until I see them all go to jail. Michael, this is uh, where I want to pick it up. If I want to focus on that uh, Central American operation, uh, you wrote. Uh, you wrote an article that's uh, going to be published um, soon in the uh, Crime, Law, and Social Change and International Journal. And the title of the article is, I Volunteered to Kidnap Oliver North. And I want to have you focus on, you know, first of all, I want to talk about the title of that article, I Volunteered to Kidnap Oliver North, and why you gave it that title and whether you're very serious about it. But before we get into the uh, this actual article, I'm interested in asking you, you just returned from uh, a little boat ride, uh, which you picked up at Columbia, in Columbia, and uh, you were addressing, uh, I guess, a very influential group of people. So what I would like you to do is talk a little bit about uh, what you were doing on that boat ride and who got off the boat uh, right after, uh, right before you got on. Yeah, well, it was a, a cruise of uh, World Presidents Organization, and I addressed them on the drug issue. Uh, the, the cruise began in... Uh, What's the World President Organization? Well, it's an organization of uh, CEOs from major corporations around the world, and uh, yeah, generally really well-meaning people who want to be illuminated, uh, who want to hear the inside story on issues. And I gave it to them. I gave them the inside story. But what I didn't know was, you see, I, I got on the, the, uh, the boat in uh, Cartagena, Colombia, and I was on from uh, Cartagena to... Uh, uh, Caracas, and then uh, in, uh, got off in Aruba. I was there about six days on the boat, but it was a, uh, about a 15 or 16 day cruise that had begun in Acapulco. And among those who had gotten on early in the cruise was Dewey Claridge and uh, the ex CIA station chief in Costa Rica, Fernandez. And uh, so Dewey, Dewey Claridge, just for people who don't know, was a former high level, or maybe he's currently, a high, it's hard to say what he is, but he certainly was working with the Central Intelligence Agency both in the Middle East yeah. and in Central America. He was one of the people who was coordinating uh, the Contra supporters who were creating the assassination manual, yeah. who were organizing the mining of harbors in Nicaragua. He was also coordinating what was going on in the beginning of the arms transfer in in uh, the Middle East. That was Dewey Claridge. Joe Fernandez, as you mentioned, the former CIA station chief in Costa Rica, was key in helping to essentially bring the CIA in a way into Costa Rica that subverted not only their uh, economy and their democracy, but led to uh, assassination, drug dealing, and so on and so forth. Okay. That's about right, Dennis. Okay. The, uh, it was kind of funny. Uh, you know, the, mo the moment I heard uh, that uh, Joe Fernandez, who I, whom I've never met personally, uh, was on uh, this boat, uh, the Seaborn Pride. Uh, I I said, and and that I that they had stopped in Costa Rica. I, 
I said, did, well, did he get off in Costa Rica? And the reason I asked uh, the question was because I know uh, President Oscar Arias, the Nobel Prize winning president of Costa Rica, had banned him from entering his country, uh, he along with Louis Tams and Oliver North, uh, for drug and gun running. And uh, so, and uh, one of the people from the crew said, no, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, he thought it would be dangerous for him, and I had to laugh, sure. <laughs> it would be dangerous <laughs> to for To go him. back to Costa Rica. Uh, yeah, it's kind of funny. You know, now, And now you take, uh, uh, you know, what really makes me laugh is uh, you have this CIA spokesman, I think his name is Christian, who uh, after DEA agent Castillo came forward and said, hey, he went to, he went to the ambassador and told him the CIA was running drugs. Well, the, this guy came up and said, we never in any way uh, support, condone, or have anything to do. Now, here you have a CIA station chief who's afraid to get off a boat. Uh, I mean, how, how much more uh, do the American people really have to tolerate before they take a stand and get rid of these criminals who are not only helping to destroy their nation, uh, who are ransacking their constitution, but as I learned in Paris last month, are also creating an image of the American people that is ugly around the world. Okay, I want to stay, I want to come back to this. I volunteer to kidnap Oliver North, Michael Levine. Hmm. Uh, I just showed you an article that appeared in today's Newsday, in which you've got Jesse Helms uh, with the support of Congress or the U.S. government under Bush, who just left, uh, threatening the Costa Rican government, saying that they want to have returned or they want to, to be these certain farmers who were had large portions of land in Costa Rica during the whole Contra War. Land, by the way, that was managed, uh, part of that land was managed by John Hall, who has now been indicted by the Costa Rican government for assassination and implicated in massive drug trafficking. They are saying that the and there's already been threats and uh, things carried out by the International Development Bank and the World Bank, that Costa Rica will be cut off if they attempt to take this land that was used by, by these people through Hull to support contra drug trafficking. If they don't get their land back, the United States is going to shut them down. Now, I think that's where we come into I Volunteer to Kidnap Oliver North. Now, are you serious? You've got an article coming out in Crime, Law, and Social Change. Are you really willing to... Go and kidnap Oliver North and do what with them? Well, uh, it it hinges upon a lot of a lot of ifs. Uh, the point of the article is to really highlight how incredibly hypocritical we have shown ourselves to be around the world vis-a-vis -vis this this drug war. Um, Oliver North was banned from ever entering Costa Rica. Why? for drug and gun running. The President of the United States called him an American hero. Uh, the U.S. Ambassador Louis Tams was banned for drug and gun running. Uh, his role in it, conspiracy, by, again, a, no a Nobel Prize winning president. Uh, Fernandez, Joe Fernandez, couldn't even get off a boat in Costa Rica because he's banned. Uh, these are high-level American officials. Now, f uh, f officially accused in what's equivalent to an information, not an indictment, which is like an arrest warrant, is John Hull for his role in working for these people. Now, the big fear... Now, and let's just say that the Costa Rican government has asked for extradition they have, of and, John Hull for assassination and murder, and in that request, they've also implicated him in drug trafficking. Exactly. And uh, ironically... The Costa Rican government, Arias, was himself the subject of threats from U.S. senators uh, that he would lose aid, etc., if he, if he quote-unquote, uh, made embarrassing accusations. Well, it, it put this, this uh, really very intelligent, well-meaning man in a strange position. I mean, here he is really wanting to fight a drug war. I mean, the drugs he was accusing these people of running were all going to the United States. And we're not talking about small amounts of drugs. Let's talk about how much we're talking about. Um, it, Tom Cepeda, when he was uh, uh, the boss of the DEA office in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, documented 50 tons of cocaine coming into the U.S. during a 15-month period at the hands of Contras and Honduran military, and they closed his office and transferred him. Uh, that, now you're talking about roughly what was estimated then is 50% uh, of U.S. consumption of drugs. At the same time, in the last decade, they've taxed, the federal government has spent $100 billion fighting drugs. 
so what happens? Here you have Oscar Arias wanting to get to the bottom of this, wanting to arrest John Hull and interrogate him and put, the, as you do in any criminal investigation, uh, make him talk, make him give specifics. We know who he was working for. He was working for Oliver North. Uh, Ali North, of course, uh, has already implicated the president during his book tour, nothing official. He said, well, he had a no. Uh, so who knows where the arrest of John Hull will lead to? You know, the U.S. government will possibly no longer be able to look the other way as we have been. During uh, uh, the Iran-Contra uh, testimony, what Americans who watched it closely found out was that all the drug-dealing evidence was given behind closed doors, secret from the American people. Uh, you know, these little... Uh, uh, little minuscule charges of lying to Congress uh, that everyone was so, ha, has been able to laugh off so easily alongside of charges uh, like conspiracy to smuggle drugs, which carry a man, minimum mandatory sentence, uh, you have to wonder whose side are these senators on. Well, it's interesting. Uh, You're uh, volunteering to uh, kidnap all of them, yeah. I know, metaphorically. It's also the case, as you know, that John Hall was smuggled out of Costa Rica by a DEA agent and uh, brought into this country. Yeah. Now, I've heard that. So isn't this a rather great irony here? We have a DEA agent smuggling uh, John Hall out of the country, this uh, uh, indicted uh, person who's indicted for murder and implicated in drug trafficking. He's now uh, listed in Interpol as uh, wanted by the Costa Rican government. And now you're uh, volunteering to take... North back. You think he'll take hold with North back? Well, uh, first of all, let me say uh, I heard the same story you did. I, but I, I never really. I don't like to assert things. I'm not. I don't have evidence of. Uh, but I've heard that. Uh, well, let me say my the, source yeah. is Tony Aragon, a journalist who spent uh, many years in Costa Rica, yeah. and who, who you will hear in another interview, has uh, verified this with the DEA that in fact John Hall did come back into this country, and supposedly there's an ongoing investigation. But I, I appreciate that you don't have the first-hand knowledge, and that's what makes your interview very important. That what you're talking about is that which you know. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, I still testify to this day. I work as a consultant and testify as an expert, and uh, yeah, I want to make sure that my credibility <laughs> kind of continues. So tell us about but it wouldn't why surprise you would, me. Tell us what, about this so-called uh, uh, volunteer uh, operation that you would, in fact, ki kidnap all the North. Well, it's based, look, uh, DEA agents, out of frustration, because their own government try to cover up, including the head of DEA, try to, try to quickly sweep uh, the murder of Enrique Camarena under a rug where it wouldn't get in the way, in the words of Commissioner Von Raab, of uh, special trade agreements and oil and uh, you, you name it, every other, every other interest uh, uh, that's more important than a, a young man's life uh, would come first. Well, the, his fellow agents, out of frustration, uh, arranged the kidnapping of a man that they thought was one of those responsible for Enrique's death. Now, those agents had to literally work around their bosses, whom would have destroyed their action had they found out about it because their very action uh, brought Camarena's death again into the headlines uh, and again threatened to embarrass the U.S. government. But they did it. They, they, they arranged for the kidnapping of this Dr. Machain, uh, who was to stand trial in, in California for his role in uh, Enrique's murder. Now, the Supreme Court uh, gave its uh, stamp of approval on their action, and when they literally said that it's legal, quote-unquote legal, for American agents to go overseas and kidnap violators of uh, those of American laws and bring them back to stand justice here. Now, I have to state that back in my career, and I begin the big white lie with this, that that's something we did anyway. I mean, uh, I took part in the kidnapping. Uh, I detail it at the beginning of the big white lie, but we used to call it something else then. We called it a controlled expulsion. Uh, it, it's. Yeah, I guess it's sort of like calling rape uh, extreme seduction, or you know, something like that. But uh, the Supreme Court, in general, uh, uh, said it's okay to do this. Well, immediately the uh, the Ayatollahs said, well, it's now okay for us to go around the world kidnapping people for violations of Islamic law. Uh, immediately, I can see that kidnapping is has become like an accepted tool of law enforcement. So I'm not talking about violating the law now. So now I I, I look around and I realize that if uh, Senator Helms and his uh, his people have their way, no U.S. Uh, uh, 
violators of uh, you know of carrying official titles may ever stand trial. I don't know. Uh, you know, I want. I took an oath once. Uh, my oath was to bring to justice anyone who smuggled drugs or or aided and abetted in it or conspired to do it into this country. I took an oath to defend the children of this United States, including those like my brother and my daughter, and. Uh, I don't care who they are, even if uh, it's Oliver North or President Reagan, if they did it, they have to go to jail. It's a terrible crime. Uh, President Bush said, this scourge will end, and all those who look the other way are as guilty as the drug dealers. I'm carrying his words out. What other country in the world officially accused these people of drug uh, dealing and drug trafficking, particularly countries that accused them of drug trafficking to the United States? Well, Costa Rica. You don't have to look too far. Costa Rica officially charged, accused Oliver North, Louis Tam, ex-ambassador Louis Tams, uh, CIA station Tis Fernandez, uh, their Rob accusation, Owen. Yeah, Bob Owen, of... Uh, their Secord. roles, Richard, Richard Secord, of their roles in smuggling drugs from Costa Rica to the U.S. Uh, now, they haven't been indicted yet. They've just been banned. But they have officially accused, uh, the equivalent to an indictment, John Hull. Now, they've asked us to give John Hull back and now extradite John Hull to stand trial in Costa Rica. So what I'm foreseeing that may happen if they ever get John Hull is that John Hull would stand trial in Costa Rica and spill his guts. And what you may see is everyone, possibly see, is everyone whom he works for, who have already been banned for drug running, subsequently officially indicted by the Costa Rican government for drug trafficking. Now, should that happen, and our government refuses refuses to extradite them, as they so far are doing with John Hull, well, I then, in order to fulfill the oath I took to the American people, will go to Costa Rica and volunteer to kidnap them working for Costa Rica. And that's the substance of, uh, of this article. Could you talk a little bit about, you write in the article about some of the outrages that uh, Oliver North and some of these other people participated in terms of uh, opening up the way for drug trafficking. Could you just give some examples? You talk about a case uh, with a Honduran general. Um, oh, Gen well, General Boiso Rosa, to me, is uh, uh, one of the most scandalous cases I've ever heard of. Uh, the, in fact, the uh, Justice Department itself described uh, the arrest of General Boiso Rosa as uh, one of the worst cases of narco-terrorism in our country's history. And then you have on record Oliver North uh, fighting to get Boiso Rosa out of jail uh, and actually enlisting the help of President Ronald Reagan in getting this drug-dealing murderer out of jail. Mind you, Boiso Rosa was charged with his role in, in smuggling something like 600 pounds of cocaine. And my friend Everett Hatcher, for instance, died for two ounces of cocaine. Uh, New York City patrolman Chris Hoban died for a couple of grams of cocaine. I can go on and on uh, ad infinitum with the law enforcement officers who have died for small amounts of this drug. Now, here you have... Well, you the, just lost your son, if I, I can, if I can son, say this. Yes, uh, and, and, uh, and my son, um, he, uh, to uh, a crack addict... Uh, who, for all I know, Bueso Rosa was supplying. And I have the your president. My son was an officer. My son was a New York City police officer gunned down by a, a crack addict who had already been convicted twice before for homicide and he had a lifetime as a crack addict. Uh, you know, if you follow the U.S. philosophy, man, uh, it, it seems that the, uh, it's most likely that some of this guy's drugs had come from U.S. supported forces. Uh, yeah, 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 I'm furious. You see, I Oliver North uh, assisted, uh, got Ronald Reagan to assist in the release of this? Ronald Reagan wrote a letter for the release of General Boiso Rosa. And uh, uh, Oliver North, in his, uh, uh, his famous uh, uh, computer notes, wrote, I'll paraphrase it, that if the general is not made happy. He has tales to tell that we don't want to hear. Now, 
the American people are due. After, after all these decades of phony drug war and hundreds of billions of dollars and, and hundreds of thousands of lives, we are owed those tales. We are, we are owed every syllable, every comma, every period of those tales. This country is owed those tales. I'm just standing out here uh, and feeling often that I'm alone in demanding those tales. Now, I was called by uh, Michael Jackson's show in, uh, in Los Angeles when Oliver, when uh, uh, Ali North was doing his book tour, and uh, I listened to him uh, say that, oh, yeah, uh, Boiso Rosa was, was picked up for some political charges. Well, I, you know, they, they asked me if I wanted to be on the air. Well, I got on the air and confronted him with everything uh, I just said, and I talked about his tales. In fact, I quoted ex-ambassador uh, Francis McNeil, who said the American people are, are owed those tales. And Ali said, I'll paraphrase him, oh, well, you're sure, uh, Frank McNeil, he'd give away all the country's secrets or something like that, as, as if this whole matter was national security. And before I could say another word, I was cut off. And I was told later, uh, you know, we thought you were finished. What was but the general doing? The general was dr smuggling drugs and murdering people here in the U.S. And uh, Ali North, of course, said that uh, it implied that that was national security. First, he lied, saying it was some political charges. He lied to America. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the point that I'm, I'm trying to bring out is who do the American people, who can we count on to tell us the truth? I mean, even the media, if the media cuts you off, the truth of the matter is our, our government, the top echelons of our government, right up to the president of the United States, were trying to get big drug dealers out of jail to, to use Ali's words, to keep their tales from being told. Now, those tales may or may not result in many high-level Americans going to jail for conspiracy, conspiracy to traffic drugs to its own people. That's a heinous crime. That's on a level with murder. Now, any politician who says, well, let's just forget about it and move on for the more important matters of uh, budget and uh, getting the economy going, uh, they, don't, they don't deserve to be politicians in this country, not representing the American people. We're speaking with Michael Levine. <clears throat> Michael Levine is a long time, was a long time undercover agent working with the DEA, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and uh, the IRS. Now, the most interesting back and forth that I had happened in Paris during this uh, uh, International Drug Watch convention when a professor from Ottawa, uh, who was an expert on the International Monetary Fund, got up to talk about third world debt to the IMF. Now, mind you, this, this little talk came up after three days of listening to representatives of the whole third world talking about how drug production is out of control around the world. There's just no way of stopping it. Now, up uh, gets this professor, and he says, well, the third world owes the IMF $1.3 trillion. At that point, I almost jumped out of my seat, and uh, I said, well, can you tell me that banks are really against the drug economy? He said, well, uh, this is not, you know, he said, well, he, he got a little incensed. He said, what, well, do you think bankers are involved in a conspiracy? I, Absolutely not. They don't have to. As long as we continue fighting drugs, you know, quote, unquote, fighting drugs, drugs that don't talk, drugs that don't fight back, as long as we're at war against a white powder, they don't have to say a word because it's a losing proposition. But what I want to know is, wouldn't they be a little upset, banks, if we suddenly won, I mean, if suddenly the drug economy collapsed, and when the whole third world has nothing but drugs to sell, and that, that $1.3 trillion, a good portion of that, is coming from drug money. By the way, uh, the uh, yearly drug economy, world drug economy, has been measured as up to half a trillion dollars. And he finally had to admit, yes, it could be very upsetting to banks. So this is what neighborhoods are fighting. The only thing, the only chance we have left is organizing against the drug economy across the country, black, white, instead of it being the divisive thing that it has become a black problem, a Hispanic problem, it can become the joining factor. Michael Levine, I just want to talk to you a little bit more about that recent uh, boat uh, tour you went to speak to these uh, executives and CEOs. I, know, I, I would just like to get a little bit of... Uh, the interaction here you are following these CIA people onto this uh, this uh, cruise 
And you really have a radical point of view, even though you might, you know, in this country, Ruth, uh, truth has become a radical act. Sure. Uh, so, what? Just talk a little bit about the interaction when you start talking about this stuff. How do well, different look, people respond? The, Who's the there? Amazing, and what do they say? Yeah. The amazing thing is, first of all, that these are very powerful people, very, very rich. And uh, what I found is a high percentage of them had actual drug problems in their family. Uh, so when I, 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 what I literally did is I had a bunch of copies of Fight Back, which go, went into in very great detail how we handled the drug problems, the mistakes we made with my brother that led to his death, uh, what we did right with my daughter, and what that had in common with drug users uh, across the board. So they were very, very interested in that aspect of it. And from that... Oh, we went into what really causes it, uh, why we all have, we have these problems. Uh, you, the, the fact that uh, uh, we've concentrated so much for so many years on the supply-side war, uh, that uh, you know, and I put it in these terms, and this really affected them. I said, look, when I went to Paris, what I, what I learned was that the American people are hated, are despised, and, and we don't even know it thanks to our media. And we're hated vis-a-vis -vis this war on drug image. And what is that image? We are a people that are saying by our acts, government, you stop that powder from coming in because if it gets in, we can't resist taking it. Now, the rest of the world looks at us as spoiled, pampered, uh, willless individuals. What, what has happened to us? Now, when they heard that, it, it, uh, what it showed me was that even these very rich and privileged people really have been hidden. They, they have not seen the truth, thanks to the media coverage any, of this Did they tell war. you any stories and about their problems? Or Yes, yes. Could many you share of some of that? What, what kinds of things did you hear from um, You don't have to name people. Okay. Uh, one, uh, one in particular, very powerful man, uh, uh, whose granddaughter is... Uh, living with a drug dealer. Uh, she, uh, the whole family is, is destroyed. Another very powerful man whose uh, uh, son died. Uh, and on and on and on. The, you know, actually the stories are typical of, uh, of the stories that you hear throughout, right across our culture. Uh, it is a problem that thanks to our government's handling of it, no one is immune from it. Everyone is, uh, everyone is affected by it. And when I told them about uh, Fight Back, and a few of them have it, uh, yeah, I now have a, a list of everyone on the ship who wants to see Fight Back. Some even said, well, supposing, uh, uh, you know, President Clinton offered you a post, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, oddly enough, I just got a note from President Clinton that he has the book and he's reading it. Um, it uh, who knows where it can go? Uh, uh, I just want, before I die to have made a difference. And uh, that's it. Yeah, I've lost too much. I've been hurt too badly. And I'm a guy that, uh, uh, you know, my, my, fa my father was, well, my father was a real bum, first of all. My, my, my dad left us when we were, you know, real young, and he got married. He was sort of addicted to women. He was a married. But the one legacy he left me, and mind you, I didn't see him from the time I was 13 until I was in my early 20s. And uh, his first words on seeing me when I looked him up in a Miami phone book were, uh, gee, I wouldn't have recognized you. And uh, this is the same man who gave me the following advice. He said, when you're in a street fight, he said, and you, you know you're going to lose, you get your breakfast. They're going to get their dinner. He said, but you get your breakfast. You keep, you hurt them. You're going to get yourself chopped up. You're going to get, you're, you're going to be beaten beyond the Pope, beyond recognition. But you hurt them because if you hurt them, they won't come back. And that's all I want to do. These people have hurt me so badly. I just want to hurt them. I want to hurt them back. If I can put them in jail, well, that's, that's great. And if I can hurt the drug economy and put them out of business, well, that's even better. And that's it. You now have the whole story of what Mike Levine is all about. Michael Levine, the way that I would... Um like to conclude this interview is to talk a little bit about the struggle that you have faced and continue to face uh, in terms of getting this material out, even though you have the authentic background and uh, it is difficult to discredit the work that you've done over these many years. You, you've had a tough time getting the material out. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that. You still have many friends who work 
as DEA uh, undercover agents and work in this official uh, capacity trying yeah. honestly to fight uh, the scourge of drugs. And uh, as you write in an article for the upcoming Extra, that's the newsletter of Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, uh, you talk about how these agents and others tend to call you and uh, you might uh, from time to time uh, play the role of psychiatrist or perhaps they'll choose you to talk instead of a, uh, a psychiatrist. And um, there's so many different questions I have about how difficult it has been for you to get the information out, but uh, let's come in through this news door. I wanted you to tell people uh, what Operation Green Ice was and how you had a difficult time before the election getting this information out. Well, yeah, let me take you back to, uh, yeah, I think it was just the month or so before the election, and uh, I was telephoned by several agents uh, from different parts of the country who were really beside themselves. Uh, they they had been ordered to, as we say, give up uh, money laundering investigations, and I was told that the... Uh, uh, Justice Department was putting together a massive roundup of money launderers and that it was it, the word had come down from the White House to put this thing together. And I didn't know the name of the operation yet, but I did know that it was nothing more than a hastily contrived massive roundup and that the result of which were many, many money laundering cases were cut short and many people would go free uh, for a politically uh, oriented roundup. And these people, uh, many agents, had to give up these cases, and they would all be publicized uh, for a desperate president who needed votes for a re-election, as though we're winning this drug war. Well, I I, uh, I went on, uh, I wrote a couple of articles about it, uh, quick articles, op-ed pieces, sent them out uh, to the press, and of course uh, none of them would, would print it. Uh, the only member of the media that would uh, you know, air my charges, and this is before the operation came to the pre came to the fore, was WBAI in New York, and on 50,000 uh, watt radio station, I got up and said, this is what your government is about to do, and uh, hopefully, I was hoping they would hear me and not do it. But evidently, uh, either they didn't hear me or they couldn't give a damn one way or the other. The operation did come out. It was worldwide press. They called it Operation Green Ice. Uh, it was touted as uh, a marvel of international cooperation. And uh, whatever it got the president, uh, thank thankfully, uh, it was not enough to get him elected. Now, I'm invited to speak at this uh, international drug watch in Paris. I went as a guest of the French government. And there I found out that uh, from uh, uh, French journalist Philippe Baudet that he had approached some of the French contingent involved in Green Ice and that they were so scandalized by the operation that they had threatened to go to the media, that it was a fraud, the whole operation. Uh, you know, you had the highest levels of our Justice Department touting this operation as a, as a marvel, as this great thrust into, the, into uh, money laundering. And all I could say was, uh, you know, I wish they had gone to the media. Well, oddly enough, when I got back to the U.S., there was one final rejection note uh, uh, for my article about the, uh, the fraud that Operation Green Ice was, and it came from the Washington Post. And in it they said, uh, that's not the kind of thing we publish. Uh, well, I already knew that. And uh, <laughs> so thankfully there is a fair, and uh, they're going to publish the article in uh, in extra. You also had and some problems tr publishing I Volunteer to Kidnap Oliver North. Too. Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, there was I, some interesting back and forth. Could you talk about that? Oh, yeah. When, uh, uh, I sent it to the American Bar Association Journal and actually got uh, uh, a really great letter from uh, the, the uh, editor who said that uh, – uh, I'll paraphrase him. The article, he said, really blew him away. It was uh, a great article. It made him angry. He said, the trouble is uh, no one's interested. And uh, no one just, no one gives a damn anymore is what it comes it comes out to. Nobody wants to know. Uh, but I don't believe that. If I, when I, The day I believe that, uh, I'll start writing uh, semi-pornographic movies about undercover agents who... Screw the world. And, uh, well, what's the response when you skip the media and go right to the people? How do people 
you you lecture around the country, around I, the world. I get How it. do people respond to you? People do they uh, want to hear people, it? People, yes, they do. People do want to hear it. They're astounded. Uh, what they're really astounded about is how little the media covers this side of the drug war. How little coverage there is, and all they want, they're hungry for the truth. And I think once the truth is out and is out constantly, as it was during Watergate, where there was a constant barrage of truth, we will then have our elected leaders finally doing the right thing, moving for a, a public hearing of all those charges Senator Kerry heard behind closed doors and some indictments for, in his words, the treason against the American people.